Welcome to the Faith to You podcast. I'm Pastor Caleb Schrader. We're continuing our series on biblical manhood and womanhood. In the first two episodes, I talked about what's on the line. We answered the question. There's there's four things that are on the line. If you want to go back and listen to those, you can understand why we're having this conversation. What I want to do today is define our terms. So today is about defining our terms so we have a common vocabulary as we work through Scripture. So what I see in Scripture is that God created male and female as complements of each other. So we would have a viewpoint that's traditionally called complementarian. So let me give you a definition of complementarianism. It is that man and woman are created equal in dignity, value, and worth, but different in roles. So so it's not that there is this belief in Scripture that men are somehow superior and women are inferior. That's not what Scripture teaches. What you see, see throughout Scripture is that God created them male and female. In the image of God, he created them, both, equal in dignity, in value, and in worth. But what we see in Scripture is that God has defined unique roles. When God made man, he said it wasn't good that man would be alone. So he created a woman who was a complement to him. And so what that means is that we complement each other in our unique sexuality, in our unique gender. The gender that God has given us is unique. I mean, what our society is trying to do today, they're trying to blur those lines. There's no different. Male, female, it's all the same. They're equal in value, but they're different in roles. So what this study is seeking to do is, what are those different roles? And, and where do we find that? God's Word, the Creator, the one who created gender is the one that we go to to understand what role he has given us. And as we fulfill those roles and operate with those in those roles, we glorify God. This is something that's in God's created order. It's something that he created before the fall. This isn't something that's cultural. This transcends culture. So male and female are equal in nature. Now, now to understand this, one, one, one illustration you can use, this illustration breaks down at different levels, is you can look at the different roles in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You, you see that Jesus, in his, in his earthly ministry, that he subjected himself in every single way to his Father. D- does that mean that he's somehow not equal with his Father? Well, you see that he regards himself as equal with his Father to the point where he's put to death for it. So there's an equality there, but with that equality, there's also at the same time a submission. (laughs) Think about this. Here's one where there's not equality but submission. Jesus with his mother. Jesus with his mother. In Jesus' relationship with his mother, as a young man at 12 years old, it said he was subjected to his parents and everything. Now, Jesus is absolutely superior to his parents, but what did he do? He honored God's created order, which is children. Respect, submit, obey your parents. Jesus demonstrated that because it's part of God's created order. So the next term I want to define is sort of the the other end of the spectrum. So one end you have complementarian, which sees male and female as created equal in value, dignity, and worth, but different in role. And then the other side you have egalitarian. And egalitarian views male and female as equal in value, in dignity, and worth, and role. And so that's the difference there, is that a complementarian said, no, there's different roles that God created, that God baked into creation for man and female. And on the other side, you have egalitarian. They say, no, there's no difference in those roles. And we're talking specifically in the family and in the church, because we see in Scripture a description for how the family is supposed to function and how the church is supposed to function according to God's design. We see different roles within the family created order, different roles within the church and God's created order. Two other terms that I want to define, um, because both sides can sort of accuse the other of believing this. So we have on one end complementarian, on one end egalitarian. Well, then there's other, other definitions as well. One is feminism. Feminism does not view male and female as equal in value and dignity and worth. It views women as superior. So 
feminism teaches, there's not equality, it's not egalitarian, it's women are superior. Anything that men can do, women can do better. That's the view of feminism, which is also a dominant view in our society today. Now, the, the fourth view I want to address is chauvinism. Chauvinism says that men are better than women. So these are not complementary or egalitarian. And so it's really important that we don't put those labels on complementary or egalitarian. Those are different terms. So chauvinism and feminism are something different all together. Now, they sort of bleed into each other. If we created VED diagrams, there'd be overlap there. But both complementarians and egalitarians say male and female, he created them. The difference is complementarian, there's difference in role. Egalitarian, there's not a difference in role. Let me read this quote from John Piper. He says, Our understanding is that the Bible reveals the nature of masculinity and femininity by describing diverse responsibilities for man and woman while rooting these differing responsibilities in creation, not convention. That, that's from Piper and Grudem's anthology, Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. So that's an excellent, excellent reference if you want to go to that. So I'm going to use their definitions of masculinity and femininity so we can have a working definition of what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine. So their definition of masculinity is this. At the heart of mature masculinity is a sense of benevolent responsibility to lead provide for and protect women in ways appropriate to a man's differing relationships. Now, there's, there's a lot that's that's in that definition right there. We're not going to take the whole thing apart, but I want to show you a few things. One of it, that's a benevolent responsibility. At the fall, with 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 the fall, we, we have man shall rule over woman. That's That's in the fallen state. That's a result of the fall. God's design is a benevolent leader a benevolent responsibility to lead, and not only lead, but provide for. Men have a responsibility to be the providers and to protect women. Men have a responsibility to protect women, and it says in ways that are appropriate to man's differing relationships. In other words, the role that I have with my wife is going to be different than the role I have with another man's wife or a single woman. The role I have with my daughters is going to be different from the roles I have with other people's daughters. The role that I have as a pastor over women is going to be different than another man's relationship with women. And so there's differing relationships within there. What about femininity? So at the heart of mature femininity is a freeing disposition to affirm, receive, and nurture strength and leadership from worthy men in ways appropriate to a woman's differing relationships. So it's a freeing disposition. You see that in God's design, a woman is freed up to affirm, receive, and nurture strength and leadership from worthy men. So women encourage this, men benevolently exercise this, and the same thing, there's differing relationships. So I, I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about mature masculinity. Um, because mature masculinity is not something that men should need permission to exercise. But one of the things I notice is in our society today, we can tend to overreact. So when our society pushes back against masculinity and calls it toxic, some men can respond to that by an attitude of, well, you want to see how toxic I can be. So, so there, is, there is such a thing as men who are toxic, men who are abusive, men who are not benevolent leaders, who are not loving self-sacrificially. But on the other hand, masculinity is not a dirty word. Being a man and operating within the role that God has designed for men to operate within is not a bad thing. And you understand our society right now is screaming at men, you need to shut up and sit down. You don't have a voice here. You don't have an opinion here that matters. That's what our society wants men to believe. It wants men to be quiet. And what we see in our society at large is that men are getting the message, they're sitting down, and they're not leading, and they're not operating within the spheres that God has designed for them to operate within. And the church and the home need to be the exception, need to be a haven where that doesn't happen, where that isn't seen. So let, let's talk about the difference between between the, the culture's sort of trope of the toxic masculinity and true 
godly, mature masculinity. And I'm going to give you a couple of descriptions of mature masculinity, and a lot of these are taken out of Grudem and Piper's book, Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. So first one, this is mature masculinity. Mature masculinity expresses itself not in the demand to be served, but in the strength to serve and sacrifice for the good of woman. So Jesus says this in Luke 22, 26, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and a leader as one who serves. Leadership is not, it's not a demanding demeanor. It's moving things forward to a goal. It's not, I am in charge, you will listen to me. That's not what mature masculinity looks like. It's not a demanding demeanor. It's moving things forward to a goal. It's taking initiative. It's speaking up. It's having an opinion. And it's letting that be known. Number two, mature masculinity does not assume the authority of Christ over woman, but advocates it. It's so important to understand that. Men don't lead their wives by saying, well, God put me in charge. Jesus put me in charge. That's not how it works. It recognizes that God has given a responsibility to lead. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. That's Ephesians 5.23. It's, it's not a leadership that gives to the man all the rights and authority that Christ has. We're operating within a delegated authority that Christ has given. Number three, mature masculinity does not presume superiority but mobilizes the strength of others. Number four, mature masculinity does not have to initiate every action but feels the responsibility to provide a general pattern of initiative. In other words, men should be taking initiative. That's one of the ways that you demonstrate mature masculinity is by taking initiative. And almost every single wife that I talk to wants her husband to take initiative. She feels safe and secure in a relationship with a man who's taking initiative, especially spiritual initiative and especially initiative in parenting their children. Mature masculinity accepts the burden of the final say in disagreements between husband and wife but does not presume to use it in every instance. What what I tell my wife is that you have my yes. What I tell my children is you have my yes. And that means I want to say yes in as much as possible. I'm only going to say no when I believe before God I can't say yes. When I believe for a family it's not the best thing. In a good marriage, decision-making is focused on the husband, but it is not unilateral. He seeks input from his wife and often adopts her ideas. This is implied in the love that governs the relationship, Ephesians 5.25. In the equality of personhood, implied in being created in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. In the status of being fellow heirs of the grace of life, 1 Peter 3.7. Unilateral decision-making is not usually a mark of good leadership. It generally comes from laziness or insecurity or inconsiderate disregard. On the other hand, dependence on team input should not go to the point where the family perceives a weakness of indecision in the husband or father. Nevertheless, in a well-ordered biblical marriage, both husband and wife acknowledge in principle that, if necessary, in some disagreement, the husband will accept the burden of making the final choice. Authority is responsibility for decisions. A husband can never say, I made that choice because my wife made me do it. Authority means taking responsibility. And from the beginning of time, man has been trying to blame his wife for the decision he made. How'd that work out for Adam? It doesn't work. Why? Because headship means responsibility, taking ownership for your decisions. You can never say, it's the woman with me, she made me do it, she convinced me to do that. That's just not how it works. God is always gonna look at the man and call the man on the carpet. Number six, mature masculinity expresses its leadership in romantic sexual relations by communicating an aura of strong and tender pursuit. So important to understand this. You know, 1 Corinthians 7 explains that your body is not your own. It belongs to your spouse. But how you demonstrate that your wife's body belongs to you is by pursuing her, by wooing her. That's what we're called to do. That's what the Song of Solomon is all about. Number seven, mature masculinity expresses itself in a family by taking the initiative in discipling the children when both parents are present and a family standard has been broken. You know, one of the things I try to encourage dads to do is when you're home, 
you're in charge. Think of it like a ship where you have the first mate on deck, but when captain uh, captain's on deck, he makes the decisions. And what happens a lot of times, especially in homes where dad's away at work all day and mom's home with the kids all day, is dad gets home and mom is exhausted from making decisions all day. She has decision fatigue, and it's going to be a blessing to support to her for her husband to come home and say, okay, captain's on deck, questions go to me, I'll be the decision maker now. When dad is home, he's taking initiative for discipline and correcting his children. That's what mature masculinity looks like. Number eight, mature masculinity is sensitive to cultural expression. Mature masculinity is sensitive to cultural expressions of masculinity and adapts to them where no sin is involved in order to communicate to a woman that a man would like to relate not in any aggressive or perverted way, but with maturity and dignity as a man. This means not dressing in ways as uh, if you're a man that's effeminate or if you're a woman in ways that are masculine. You're making sure that your, your dress is appropriate to your gender. Those are things that are defined culturally. Um, it also means learning manners and customs. So it, in the Bible, it doesn't say that a man should open a door for a woman, but in our culture, it does say that that's something that men do when they're sensitive. And so that's mature masculinity. That's what it looks like, is honoring some of those customs and cultures in our society. Last but not least, number nine, mature masculinity recognizes the call to leadership is a call to repentance and humility and risk-taking. You know, one of the lies that we believe as men is that to be a leader, I can't admit I'm wrong. No, to be a leader, you must admit that you're wrong. You need to own your mistakes. You need to own them out loud with those that you're leading so they can learn from you, so they can see your clay feet, so they can realize that the person they're following sees when he's made a mistake. He owns it, he learns from it, and he grows. That gives him security in following you. This is what mature masculinity looks like. And if men would honor God's standard for their gender, then we wouldn't see it as toxic. We wouldn't see it as as evil in our society. And, And those who do call that toxic just do that because they hate the Lord, because they hate his word, because they hate conforming to his standards. You see, there's this glorious peace that we have when we honor the design that God has, when we operate within the confines of his good design for our gender. And so these are what I mean when I say complementarian, when I say mature masculinity, when I say mature femininity. These are the things that we're working towards. These are the terms I'm using. Try to use them accordingly and try to honor them in your family and in your church. Thank you so much for listening today.